no other statesman, was that the Soviet empire was neither strong nor durable, but rickety and unsustainable. And Reagan knew all America needed to defeat communism was to be unyieldingly hostile toward it, to never accept that it was permanent. Which brings me back to that tale from the last day in Moscow, the argument over peaceful coexistence, and that slip of paper Colin Powell handed to the president. Did you find out what was on that night? Well, it said, this language means you agree never to criticize the Russians. That was something Reagan did not want to do. He would not agree to that in a million years. That was it. The game was over then. Early in his administration, when Reagan had consigned the Soviet system to the ash heap of history, many people, especially the Soviets, had misunderstood his words to mean that he was bent on its destruction. Rather, he had been saying that the Soviet system was already collapsing that history was already marching past it. By the time of the Moscow summit, that fact was evident to everyone, including the Soviets themselves. Reagan's prediction was coming true, as he, if not others, had always known it would. Good evening and welcome to a very special edition of Tucker Carlson tonight. Again and again on this program, we have clashed with our very own liberal Sherpa. She is Catalina Magazine founder Kathy Aru. Kathy is willing to defend pretty much any new fad on the left, whether it's hiding in cry closets or getting consent before you change your baby's diaper. Tonight, we're going to be revisiting some of our most contentious and enlightening engagements with the liberal Sherpa. One of the most memorable came earlier this year when Purdue University published a guide urging students to avoid the words mailman and mankind and any other man-based word because they are sexist. Kathy Aru strongly agreed. I, I gotta say, there, there's kind of a basic irony here. I mean, you're what? lecturing us about sexism while you're sitting right now in Manhattan. Manhattan. We need to rename the city then. Um, the, yeah. the, the, the Big Apple. The Big Apple would be less offensive. So I feel that I'm sitting in the Big Apple, not Manhattan. Okay, but why stop there? Why should the post office deliver mail? I know. Well, it's spelled M-A-I-L, so that's okay. If it's M-A-L-E, no, then no, no. there's Ho a problem. Homonyms count, and this applies to email, too, because it's not about spelling. It's about being gender inclusive, right. and mail is offensive. We just learned that. So. Well, well, no, I don't think they're including that, but they are saying that society has changed and times are changing, and we don't want to be offensive in our language. And they're trying to be non-sexist and non-biased, and that means trying to take the word man out. So instead of man-made, it would be synthetic. So um, instead of mailman, it would be mail carrier. So there's many ways to go around it. Instead of humanity, you should say people. But so, mail um, carrier still has mail in it. So you have It's kind of a fake. Oh, but that's a judge. Or package I mean, carrier. Well, I mean, wait, we can on. come up with so many other terms uh, that are I'm less saying. offensive. Yeah. You might still offend dyslexics. You can change a vowel, but it sounds the same. It has that dreaded word that sends people shrieking for their safe spaces, male. Well, they're saying man. Man is the word that they're trying to avoid. They're saying that the word man is associated with adult men and as opposed to just humanity or humans. So um, they're trying to avoid the word man. So as, if we can eliminate that word, then things would be much better and people would be less offended. Well, what if you lived in Manchester, Vermont? Well, they would, might have to change the name of the city uh, if people agree with Purdue University. And Purdue University found that things need to be updated, and they updated their writing guide to take out these words that apparently are offending certain groups of people. Okay, so just to make sure I understand the yeah. rule, if mm -hmm. something offends somebody, even yeah. if you've never met that person personally, right. 
right. you have to change it. So doesn't that mean that a small group of super unhappy people get to control what the rest of us say and think? Well, perhaps they're ahead of their time. Maybe this is something that is offending a small group, but the group's going to get larger and times are changing and our language is dynamic. Webster keeps adding right. new words in the dictionary. So our language needs to change and a term that used to be non-offensive like man made and male man now needs to be changed. Well, I can I get that. I just I guess the question for me is yeah. who gets to decide what changes and what doesn't. So for example, I think I've now decided that the most offensive word in the language is college professor oh okay because okay. to me that connotes dumbness and misuse of power mm. and tenure right and mediocrity so maybe i'd like to say no one can use that word ever again in my presence because it offends me would that fly could i do that could i pull it well, off well if you have a, a writing guide perhaps and you put that out there and people um, agree with you then yeah maybe maybe that would fly but Purdue University did find a group that agreed with them, and the university backed them up, and there you have it. They have a writing guide that now is going to teach us how to uh, not offend. But do you but think they have the people. guts? I mean, it's one thing to bully the little rich kids who go to your school, because, like, what do they know? Is, but do you think they Indiana. have the guts? This is, this is the heart of America. Yeah, no, of, of course, but if you're paying, like, 60 grand or whatever it is for, mm -hmm. like, the fake diploma you get, you know, I, and you're not working, obviously you have privilege by definition, no matter who's paying for it. But, do, so okay. it's, but it's easy to boss them around. Do you think they would have the guts to go to Goldman Sachs in New York and say, change your name now or else? They probably wouldn't shop there. They probably wouldn't shop there because <laughs> well, if they were because shopping the name, at Goldman Sachs, they the might name. come up short. Because it's a bank. Because the name man is adult male. And yeah, we need to, we need to change it. Like, like woman, I mean, has the word man in there. So just call us um, a person. Uh-huh. So gold person sacks, would that be better? I think so. I, I'm, I'm less offended. Yes. <laughs> and by the way, what if you just, since the rule is if you spell it, and I'll, I'll stop with this because I know we're, this is angels on the head of a pin at this point, but if you spelled man differently, like M-A-A, -A, so it was male man, but M A A N. No, no. Would the you profession get past the we know that the professions uh, usually were male dominated, and they've changed. So no, saying male man and spelling it differently that doesn't apply. We're trying to say this profession now applies for men and uh, women or persons, all people. No Wait, man but isn't needed. There a man, no man hold on. Needed. Isn't there a man in the word woman? Call call me a person. I'd I'd be less offended. No need wow. for woman. Okay. Yeah. In the end, the revolution always eats itself, as we often point out. College exams are, of course, stressful, but for most of human history, we counted on students to deal with that stress. But at the University of Utah, an art project has offered students an alternative to that. It's a cry closet where they could sob for a few minutes at a time in solitude. Kathy Rue thought the idea merited expansion to other campuses. Watch. So uh, at first glance, it seems a little confusing because college, of course, is the least stressful place there is. I mean, it's, it's already stressful? a yoga ritual. Well, sure. I mean, you go to class for two hours a week and get drunk the rest of the time. Oh, come on. That's Why are college students experience? crying? No, it's very stressful. They're, they're learning. They're the, the future. These are our are, are citizens of tomorrow. And they're learning as much as they can. They're as stressed as can be, so they need psychological health. They need this bioenergetic way to get out their stress. They need 10 minutes of a good cry and a cry closet to then be prepared to take those exams from everything they've learned in those classes. So, we don't have time for you to define bioenergetic on the show, so I'm going to okay. let that pass. I'll okay. email you later. Thank you. Um, but do you, does this suggest something maybe about the fragility of their mental health? I mean, if you're so stressed about taking some, some dumb test at some dumb school, doesn't that mean that you're kind of on the edge of a breakdown? Well, no. Don't we all need a good old-fashioned cry? This is all it's saying. This is an old-fashioned remedy to a modern-day problem. It's, it's just about crying, 10 minutes of crying. Everyone needs a stress ball. Many people own stress balls, so this is just an interpretation of a giant stress ball. So let's say we had a war. Let's say, I yeah. don't know, pick a country. China uh, challenged us in some way where we had to mobilize a large number of Americans to defend the homeland. Okay. But everyone's crying. Would anybody be left 
to fight the war? I mean, can you really defend a country if you're encouraging kids to cry about final exams? Well, this is about psychological health. So if everyone takes a moment aside to just center themselves, ground themselves, have a cry maybe for two, three minutes, and then go fight that war, I'm sure the war would be won with people could, in such a great state of mind. Could you take a break conceivably between battles to cry? Well, I think the break would probably have to be done before the battle, but they right. would be in the right mindset before that battle that they would win that battle. So I think that's what this whole closet is about, the cry closet. It's about getting that right state of mind. So, um, would, yeah. Would you, would you want to use a closet others have cried in? <laughs> I don't think I'd have a problem with it. It sounds very cozy. And Google has done this out in Silicon Valley. So many companies right. have created these, these, you know, ping pong tables and very comfortable corporate settings where people can let off steam. So if a, if a cry closet is called for, how about like a petting zoo? like a, a, a bunny stroking station. Is that, is that too far? Or could you envision that? You know, it's, it's the future. If people are comfortable and work better after being centered and calmer, then why not? Bring the bunnies in, yes. Let me just, let me just ask you a macro point, and I, we haven't talked about this, I don't, I don't wanna shock you or anything, but like, I thought the whole idea was to get people to come out of the closet, but here you're looking right in the camera and saying people go back in the closet. Do you as a progressive feel good about that? I go in for 10 minutes and get that cry so that you can come out confidently and feel good. I mean, you might want to go into that cry closet right before show and, you know, have a great show afterwards. Okay, so. How on, I mean, I know this is like television. You don't want to be too honest, but let's try to push the level. I'm always honest here. with you. If you knew a man who you thought, I could date that man or marry that man, I find that man attractive, and he said, I'm sorry, I just gotta take a quick break mm -hmm. and go cry in a closet while squeezing a stuffed animal. That would kind of wreck the deal for you, wouldn't it, honestly? I, I think he would probably say, I'm gonna go center myself so that I can be a stronger, better person for you. Yeah, I, I would love that person. I, I think that's great, I think that's healthy. Who doesn't want to be with the but healthy part person? Of you would, part of you would look on contemptuously and say, you weepy little freak, stop crying. Right? I would say, what a strong person who understands themselves or herself or whatever pronoun that person wishes to call themselves. I don't believe you. I don't believe you <laughs> I for a there. second. Yeah. I think you'd want to think that just as a, as a good progressive, you would think this is wholesome. This is consistent with my no. ideology. No, but I on a gut level, you would say, stop whimpering. Every place has a cry closet. Every place has a safe place. I mean, cry closets can be the bathroom right now at many companies. Everyone needs a good cry closet. It's an old-fashioned way of letting out stress and um, relieving tension. Up ahead, we've got plenty more highlights from the liberal Sherpa. We'll revisit her defense of getting consent from babies before changing their diapers. Stay tuned. to our extremely special liberal Sherpa edition of Tucker Carlson tonight. A pink haired sex educator in Australia recently declared that parents should seek consent from babies before changing their diapers. Otherwise those babies could grow up to tolerate sexual assault. Well, of course, human babies can't consent to anything. They can't really do anything. They're babies, doesn't matter. Kathy Ruth thought it was a great idea. So um, consent for diaper changing from babies. This raises, yeah. leaving us out whether it's a good idea, it raises, it raises the obvious practical question. Yeah. How would a baby give consent? Well, the idea isn't exactly, the baby's not exactly going to say yes or no, but she's saying give the baby a few moments, talk to the baby, say, is it okay I'm going to change your nappy? Because she's Australian, so that's how they um, say diapers. Yes. Can I you change your say nappy? That's an American baby. I don't think the confused. American baby would understand. But it's actually yeah. just teaching um, consent, what consent is. It's teaching bodily autonomy. It's teaching, hey, um, I'm not going to touch your body if you don't want me to. It's just like talking to a baby about anything. Thing. Mommy loves you. Daddy loves you. So people talk to babies right. all the time. So why wouldn't the concept of talking to a baby while doing something so serious as, you know, um, changing a diaper be so ridiculous? Sounds because quite normal. Because you don't typically expect a baby to respond in a way that you can understand. Again, how do you know what consent looks like? So let's just do a little role playing if we could. Role you be playing. the baby, the I baby. be the parent. Okay. okay. And you're changing and my I diaper. Say, I'm going to make this change, mm -hmm. and you, how do you express your consent or lack of consent for that? 
Well, if I start crying, something's wrong. So you probably don't want to do anything at that moment because you wouldn't want to make diaper changing something that goes along with crying. You would probably want me to be in a healthy state of mind so that in the future, when it comes to those private things, I'd be in a healthy state of mind. I'd be a well-adjusted adult. So a well-adjusted baby you were would be crying. a well-adjusted adult. Wait, but maybe the child's crying because his diaper is dirty. Right, obviously, yeah. So, I mean, the parent would have to be the best judge of that, but I guess okay. if you would make me cry, if you asked me if I wanted you to and then I started crying, then maybe you should get a hint, take the hint. Are there, would it be like an eye gesture? Like, do, <laughs> I mean, you're a mom, do, do your kids, I mean, can you read their facial expressions and know it's that super, they're it's, what they're saying? It's super healthy. Erickson said, uh, an expert, a baby expert, that from zero to two are the trust years. So during these trust years, you want the baby to trust you. So there's nothing wrong with talking to a baby and those situations, just teaching a baby how to trust. So this is a moment where you're teaching a baby to trust you. So I don't think the baby is expected to necessarily <laughs> give consent. You're just teaching the baby to trust you. You're what asking a baby kid... for bodily. Uh, you're asking the baby to express bodily autonomy. I think that's that's the big point. Right. Here. Babies yeah. don't. They're not super great at understanding English. In my experience of having a number of them. But this I, is how know, they learn maybe English. Maybe other babies are more intelligent than mine were. But what if the child keeps saying no, like over a period of weeks, and you keep going in there? You know, I'd really like to change the diaper, but the child refuses to give me consent. At some point, that becomes neglect, right? And also I, nasty. I think it's the concept of teaching, teaching the consent, talking about it. During that moment, so many parents do not discuss it. And they, the babies uh, grow up. And in the English language, they're not even used to talking about those things. So the concept <laughs> is teaching, t teaching trust. It's trust issues. But you don't Zero really discuss anything years. with a baby. I mean, it's in the same you sense. You discuss everything with the baby. You may talk to your dog, I'm but you don't your arm. discuss I'm with put your this dog. I'm going to put this lotion on your arm. You talk about everything. I'm, I'm going to dress you. Parents talk to babies about, all day long. I'm going to cook dinner for you. What about a polio vaccine? Should you're, you or polio, you're gonna have a, Yes, pox. you're going to get a vaccine. Would, I mean, don't right? people have to give consent? That you can't give organs if you don't give consent, right? So if you have consent, even dead people can make decisions. Why can't babies? So from Dead birth people can to, make decisions? How do they I, do that? Well, you have to give consent to have the organs taken after you die. So... If you can give consent from a baby year to your death, people should always give consent if their body is going to be so, touched. Right. So if the child says, no, I don't want the baby indicates by crying or rolling his eyes, I don't I want think, a polio vaccine, then you just you just don't get him a polio vaccine. Then I think it's the the idea of discussing it with the baby. The consent, I don't think, is necessarily the issue. It's the idea. Oh. You're developing trust. So even if the baby says no, no doesn't really mean no, <laughs> is what you're saying. The baby can't talk during the diaper Right. Years, so with babies, so. no doesn't mean no. I, I totally get that. Where does the obedience part come in? Is there any part in the relationship with your child where the child learns to obey what you say? Or is it always kind of a, a, a give and take, a colloquy? With a, with a mute person. This is, this is about conversation, talking to the baby. It's a conversation. <laughs> it's not disciplining. It's, these aren't the discipline years, as, right. as child experts Is there a point say. where the baby says, you know, mom, please stop talking. You just, you talk or too dad, much. Just go, or ahead dad. And go ahead and change the diaper. I don't think most dads would go for this, but I mean, oh, okay. whatever. Maybe, maybe dad, I don't know. Right. Don't, hey, right. parents, stop talking. Just go ahead exactly. and change it. I, I, I don't think these are the years that the baby would be able to respond, but it's just the, getting the concept <laughs> of I'm touching your body. You have bodily autonomy. You should always have the right to say yes or no if someone's going to touch your body. And I'm going to teach that concept right now during uh -huh. the trust years, which is I like zero the concept that kids do what they're told. That's my favorite concept for kids. You just yeah. Sort of do, yeah, do what we tell you to do. But why stop at diapers? Our Kathy Rue special continues up ahead. She explains how to use exotic new pronouns. Move over he and she. It's time for yo and V. 
Live from America's News Headquarters, I'm Alicia Acuna. From coast to coast, Americans mark this July 4th with barbecues, parades, and fireworks. But it's no holiday for the thousands of firefighters battling more than 60 wildfires burning across several western states, including California, Utah, and New Mexico. Thousands of people have been evacuated throughout that half of the country. One of the worst is the spring wildfire in Colorado. It has destroyed more than 100 homes. The flames stretch beyond 123 square miles, five times the size of Manhattan. Three more prospective Supreme Court nominees have spoken with President Trump. That raises to seven the number of people the White House says Mr. Trump has interviewed for the job of replacing retiring Justice Anthony Kennedy. The president will reveal his choice next Monday. I'm Alicia Cunha. Now back to the Tucker Carlson Tonight Special. As progressives have grown increasingly more radical by the day, the number of pronouns they use has exploded. At UC Davis earlier this year, the school's LGBTQIA Resource Center produced a guide for using eight different gender neutral pronouns. They included XZ, N, V, and Yo. Kathy Rue knows what those mean. She explained it to us. I want to walk you through some of these pronouns, and I want to take it as seriously as I can, yeah. because I know very soon I'll be forced to participate at gunpoint, so we might as well start now. It's not forced at we're, gunpoint. You're going to well, enjoy it. Well, I think it. If, 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 if recent history is any precedent, yes, we're laughing about this now. It'll be mandatory tomorrow. Uh, so let's start with the pronoun Z yes. for he, she, and Zer for him and her. Right. How would I ask the following sentence? Okay. Did she enjoy herself at the party? Um, did, I want to, I want to get it right. Did Z enjoy herself at the party? Okay. That sounds like Henry Kissinger. Okay. That sounds like a German accent. Are you sure that's right? That is absolutely correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. This is okay. in many universities have put out uh, these pronoun guides. So okay. yeah. So because a Germanic accent is more sensitive. I, 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 I'm, I'm tracking with this now. So let's, let's try this sentence using again, Z and Zer. Of course. She cooks dishes using ingredients she has grown in her yard. It would be uh, Z cooks dishes using ingredients Z has grown in their yard. Their yard. Yes. Their yard. Now, their you're, yard. now you're a French waiter. I love this. No, okay. I'm Great being, job. I'm, I'm not mocking correct. you. I'm, oh, I'm, 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 yes. You definitely are. And I'll have the yes. coke and syrup, please. Now we're going to move on now to co, co and cos. Exactly. If I'm pronouncing it correctly. You Call are, actually, yes. Okay, so we're yes. going to translate, the, if you wouldn't mind, this sentence. I don't mind. He, he asked himself whether his gender pronouns were mildly confusing for others. So co asked co self. Uh, whether Co's gen uh, cost gender pronouns were mildly confusing for others. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mildly confusing still, but you've cleared it up a little bit. Okay, now we're going to move to Z and her. Right. Okay, so how would I say his car broke down so he had to walk here by himself? It would be um, here car broke down so Z had to walk here by herself. And that's different from pigeon English how? Well, this is accepted by the LGBTQIA community and different colleges and universities going from Vanderbilt to uh, California to Georgia have accepted these and added them to their pronoun usage um, grammar books. So. <laughs> I know a number of members of that community have never heard of any of this, but whatever. We're going to try one last one, and my producers promised me this is real. Yeah. It's yo. Yo, And this yes. is why I think this is written by The Onion, but whatever. They promise this is real, according no, this is to real. the scholars at UC Davis. Yo is for he and she. Yes. Yas, or yos, is him or her. And, of course, yourself yo. is for himself, herself. So how would I ask... Right. She'd better leave now if she wants to make her flight in time. So, so, yo better leave now if yo want to make your flight on time. The, yo's the, flight on time. Yo's flight. I'm sorry. Yo's flight on time. Yes. And okay. it can be purse. P-E-R-S. I mean, there's different. You could choose whichever pronoun uh, you're comfortable with. So it doesn't have to be one of these pronouns. There are many. That there are many. An infinite, many. Of, yes, the, an infinite number. But isn't the purpose number. of language yes. is to communicate mutually agreed upon definite using mutually agreed upon definitions, right? So if right. I replace language with something that's dumber, less precise, and embarrassing, how does it forward 
the purpose of language itself, which is to facilitate communication. It's smarter, uh, not offensive, and um, forward thinking, I think, is the way we'd be correcting our language. Uh, you know, you're totally right. And I've forgotten the kind of underlying assumption here, which is that all change is good. All change is good, and language does change, and this is a sign of the future. And in 50 years, I mean, this is just going to be automatic. We're not even going to think twice. So the transgender community has embraced this. I think it's a question of not grammar. Well, uh, first of all, there's, no, there's no community. I mean, what does that even mean? By the way, can I just say, because I can't resist, what? if I ever wake up one morning and what? find that I have been drafted involuntarily into some community, I'm going to I'm going to resist because I'm not the only community I'm a part of is my family and I don't want to be in a community. I mean, does anybody ever say, you know what, I'm not part of your community? Well, well, that's the that's the beauty of this. I mean, you can be part of a community. You don't have to be part of a community. You can you could be who you want to be. You could say, hey, I don't want a pronoun. No pronoun for me, please. And no, you can't. Cause yes, you can it, do that. Everything is mandatory. That no. all change is good. Everything is mandatory. Those are the two uh, rules we all live by now. Pronouns aren't the only thing whipping the left into a frenzy these days. During prom season this year, a high school student in Utah dared to wear a Chinese-style dress despite not being Chinese. That's a war crime, as you know. Kathy Rue came on the set to set that woman straight. Does this go both ways? Does this mean that, I mean, Chinese people are wearing neckties, which is a Western invention are they committing cultural appropriation by doing that well it, what she did is almost like an exploitation of a culture she's exploiting it it's appropriation because she is taking advantage of a culture she doesn't really know much about i don't think a, a businessman a chinese businessman doesn't understand the western culture he understands what the tie is he understands what the suit is but she had right. no idea what this dress meant and what it's about and she didn't even appreciate it one of her one of her comments was it's just a effing dress I mean, this is a culture. She borrowed a culture and she cared so little to appreciate it. So assimilation, right. which we've thought for hundreds of years was a good thing, right. is the process of cultural appropriation. I come in and I take parts of your culture and make them my own. I adopt your culture. Well, we thought she, that was good, but now the idea is that everyone stays in their own culture, and then of course, by definition, hates every other culture. But. There's assimilation and there's appropriation, and she didn't do this to assimilate, to get to know a culture. She did it to just enjoy it for an evening, get as much fame and publicity out of it as she could on Twitter and Facebook and social media, and just step right out. So how so, convenient. But, well, let me ask you this, when someone, from, when someone from Dubai flies on an airplane, which was, of course, invented by the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, right. Why isn't that an even more effect and just gets on the plane and has a glass of champagne and doesn't think about the contribution of these Ohio brothers to flight? That's perhaps, not cultural appropriation? They are, but I don't think that they're um, getting anything. They're not hurting anyone and they're not offending anyone by doing so. And when, okay. she, did, when she put on that dress, she hurt and offended others. And she that's did. What she, she really hurt them. We've learned that wearing certain dresses is an act of bigotry, but it doesn't stop there. Yoga, it turns out, is racist too. Kathy Rue was there to explain exactly how. Our special continues with that next. Welcome back to our special Liberal Sherpa edition of Tucker Carlson tonight. The Liberal Sherpa has always been happy to come on our program. We're grateful for that and explain how everything is racist, even if nobody knew until about 10 minutes ago. To most people, yoga is a fun exercise from India, but wiser minds know that it's bigoted, maybe even a form of cultural genocide. Kathy Rue was there to explain yoga's highly problematic nature. Here it is. Yoga is racist. How is that? Well, according to this article, many white people who do yoga, and it's mostly white people who do yoga, so uh, few of them understand the culture, the history, and the religion behind yoga, and they're simply enjoying it for the physical aspects of it. So they're not truly understanding yoga and what it goes back to, and um, they need to if they want to appreciate it, and if not, they're simply giving into this uh, viewpoint of white supremacy, according to this 
Professor. Huh. So if, if yoga is racist, is hot yoga more racist or less? <laughs> all Western yoga is racist, according to this author, according to this professor. All Western yoga. So yoga that is practiced in India has nothing to do with the yoga that's practiced in uh, the Western world. Huh. So, what about yeah. Pilates? Are those safe? Pilates was not discussed in the article. It's Western yoga as a whole. It's being practiced by white people, white women, upper class, middle class people, Ooh. not minorities, Ooh. not Latinos, not immigrants. Ooh. Yeah, so this is this is a white um, sport, a white well, that's, activity. Well, that right there is suspect. Okay, so, you know, call the police. What about Taekwondo? I mean, by these standards, that might be banned, right? Well, by this author's standards, perhaps, but she really has a problem with the yoga in industrial, I think it was, uh, yoga industrialization, industrial complex. That's what she called it, the yoga industrial complex. So, that, so, if so it's maybe wrong, Taekwondo falls under that. If it's wrong for people in the West to practice yoga, is it wrong for people in the rest of the world to use the internet, which was created here? Part of our cultural legacy? Well, I think we understand the culture of the internet, and it doesn't go back to the British colonizing India and what the Indians had to do to uh, introduce them to yoga and show them that their culture was actually intelligent, and that was part of the yoga movement, and that's how it came to the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries. So, okay. yeah, so the internet would not. Um, fall the into internet this. would not. No, what no. about like democracy? I mean, that was invented by the Greeks in the West, right, the right. basis of Western civilization. No, then again, no, no, no. Yoga was a way for the Indians to show their colonizers that they were intelligent and that they had this wonderful... <laughs> Where do you read your history? It's this, totally this wrong. Is what this, this yoga is what this predates the British saying. by quite a bit. Okay, but so I, I just wanted to be interested. How many people who are into yoga in the United States do you think voted for Donald Trump? Oh, well, the author didn't touch upon that, but... But what's your guess? I mean, as someone who's very familiar with non-Trump voters, would you say maybe 1% of people who practice yoga voted Trump, or is that too high? I, it, according to the, the author, uh, many middle and upper class white women practice yoga. So those people who fit into that category uh, and are Trump supporters voted for Trump. So are, do, are you struck by the fact that that series of descriptors, upper middle class, white, like that's kind of the whole argument on the left now. So anything that has those words attached is just bad just because, and anything that doesn't is superior to that. Uh, yeah, according to this article, those are the people who practice yoga and uh, do not understand immigrants and minorities and what they're going through and perhaps have more privilege and are able to experience yoga and other things that other groups cannot experience. So last question, if in a multicultural society, which we live in, and, right. and I'm, I'm for the basic principle, which is there are cool things about other cultures and you should enjoy them. Mm -hmm. When do the rules change? So we live in a multicultural society, but you're not allowed to enjoy cool things from other cultures, or if you do, you have to feel guilty about it. How uh, does that work? Well, the author said, by no means don't stop doing yoga, but if you do it, understand that you're only understanding an eighth of it, that there's so much more to yoga. So understand oh. what people went through to introduce this to you from their culture to your culture. So have an appreciation. Don't just take advantage of it and buy the yoga gear and take advantage of this wonderful tradition that was brought to you by another culture. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I haven't tested it, but I suspect downward dog is harder to enjoy if you're hating yourself while you do it, wouldn't you think? I don't think anyone would hate themselves. They would just know more <laughs> about the point, it. Of they should know more about downward <laughs> more dog. More self-loathing. Up next, a blast from the past. The time Kathy Rue argued we shouldn't call breastfeeding natural since that could undermine feminism. That's next. Well, a study last year in the journal Pediatrics described it as, quote, unethical to call breastfeeding natural because doing that might undermine feminism, despite the fact, of course, it's true. The study also said that, quote, coupling nature with motherhood can inadvertently support biologically deterministic arguments about the roles of men and women in the family, which is, of course, insane. Fortunately for us, though, Kathy Aru is not most people, and she sees that as reasonable. Here's how she described it. 
So this is kind of a baffling story. One, that people are inserting politics into breastfeeding, which seems like it would be off limits for politics. But, right. but two, why it would be controversial to call breastfeeding natural. If, if breastfeeding is not natural, what is natural? Well, breastfeeding doesn't come naturally, as pediatricians will tell you. It's not exactly easy. There are lactation specialists out there. There's a whole industry sure. out there. So breastfeeding isn't exactly natural. It doesn't come naturally to women. So what they're saying is, uh, which I'm so happy there's a study out there that are finally letting women not have this guilt trip that it's okay to hand the formula over to daddy to the men and it's natural for a man to feed a baby so they're saying that only a woman able to feed a child is is inappropriate it's unethical and inappropriate and i'm so what? so glad well, that women it, it, are left off let off the hook finally i mean it, it's not unethical or inappropriate whatever those words mean i mean it can it's the opinion of some physicians that breast milk is superior to formula and other people disagree and it's a it's a debate um, that has raged for quite some time, but it's what you seem to be saying is it is bad because it suggests that women have a different role in right. motherhood than men do, but would they do because women are the only people biologically capable of bearing children. Is that now a controversial observation? Well, but, well, the study is saying, though, that women are not the only ones who could feed the children. So that's what they're trying to say. It is natural for others to be able to feed the children. So the whole burden is not on the mother. So that's what they're trying to say with this okay, study. Well, that's, that's, I mean, but that's, okay, first of all, uh, of course that's true. Right. Uh, of course. And, but, so but that's kind of a decision. That. What do you mean? They're, I don't think women are well, stupid. I, oh, well, there are and some I think, women that actually, I, I interviewed a pediatrician that had a mother that had a child starving for two weeks. She was not able to lactate. She was not able to produce breast right. milk for two weeks. The baby had lost weight and she refused to give that baby formula for fear that her baby was not going to get the perfect breast milk and okay. would have to turn to formula. The okay. baby oh, ended I think up that's, in the NICU. Th that's a totally fair point. And that's right. a shame when people feel like, and people you do know, there's like no that. alternative. Perhaps there are some, but that's not what's really going on here. This is gender politics intruding on the personal decisions that parents make. Well, we and need it, it It's though. also we, blurring we the lines. This. It's suggesting, by the way, that men can breastfeed which I don't think they can. It's suggesting can that men could, I, well, I don't know, but it's suggesting that Well, I that do men, know. The answer <laughs> is they can't. So. I have four children, I can, uh, I can I tell you. I don't know. I don't know your secrets, but um, no. What they're saying is that men can feed children. They're finally putting a study out there that's saying that breast milk is not the only way to go. There are other ways. Can, can you just take three steps back no. and acknowledge that there's something pretty awful about inserting gender politics into something as I, beautiful I, and intimate as the first days of a child's life. You know and what? maybe parents can say, hey, back and off. It's and not just... beautiful. Breastfeeding is not beautiful. Breastfeeding, it causes so many headaches and, and it can be so horrible. And it, as a pediatrician told me, it doesn't come naturally for so many women. So this study, I think, is wonderful because so w women can finally step back and say, wow, it's okay to hand the bottle and the baby over to dad okay. or, or my girlfriend or okay, whatever well, the case may be. Half of that sentence is correct, of course. It Thanks. is absolutely okay to do that. Thanks. But I'm just wondering, final question for okay. you, because this is giving me a little bit of a headache. I'm sorry. No offense to you. No, no, it's not your fault, but just the whole subject is so crazy. If it's not natural to breastfeed, how did like the species get to where it is now? Like, why didn't we die out several millennia ago? I think we found other ways like formula to feed the babies. So, and okay, years so ago, like in, during the medieval period, like where did you get the Similac then? Well, well I, yeah, exactly. I'm not quite sure, but this breastfeeding oh. phenomenon has been going on for the last 10 years. But before that, our mothers weren't all exactly into breastfeeding. You had the, the feminism, the, the revolution, the 70s. Women did not breastfeed like they do nowadays. So the breastfeeding okay. has not always been the answer. Man, I'm glad my kids are older enough to weigh into this stuff. A 30-year-old son refused to move out of his parents' house, so they had to sue him. Our liberal Sherpa special continues with that story next. Welcome back to our extremely special liberal Sherpa edition of Tucker Carlson tonight. Michael Rotundo is a 30-year-old man who has lived in his parents' basement rent-free for eight years. They've asked him to move out five times. They gave him money for a new place, but he refused to leave. Finally, they sued him. It was a sad story. It says a lot about an entire generation. We welcome the liberal Sherpa to talk about it. 
So, Kathy, he's 30 years old, but he says he doesn't want to leave. Right. Should he be forced to leave? But why? I mean, a third of 18 to 35-year-olds in this country live with their parents. So he's actually normal. And Michael loves his mom. He wants to be with his mom. What's so wrong with that? He loves his parents. So he's normal, and he wants to be with his parents at a time when he, well, we don't know if he does any of those things but we do know that he's not ready to leave his mom's at his it's not his basement he has a bedroom he said clearly he doesn't live in the basement so okay. um sorry yeah, sorry so, i didn't mean on. to impute his character okay right right <laughs> i mean he what's wrong with loving your mother and in the future maybe she will want to live in his bedroom in his house when he He's more adjusted and feels better and is prepared for the world. Maybe Michael will have a nice house, maybe a mansion, thanks to their support that they wouldn't spend that money on the lawyers, but they'll actually spend it on him and his future, on their son. No, and I think I'm, I'm following you. Look, I'm trying, as always, I'm yeah. trying to discern right. a theme here that I can apply to other parts of my right. life. So okay. if you love something, you get it for free, which I understand. So if I love, I don't know, a Rolex watch, do I get it for free? I mean, if I really love it. If I it's, really love it. This is a parent and a child. If you're a parent, you're always a parent. So if she's a mom, she's always a mom. If this is a son, okay. he's always a son. So they should always love each other. They shouldn't right. hire lawyers and go against each other in court as the mother did. Well, she's I agree. I, well, I totally agree. But what right. if I love the watch and I need to know what time it is because right. otherwise you get law. You, you need to know what time it is, okay? But, and I love that watch. It's a sincere love. Why would they call the cops on me if I just take it? it it's about responsibility. She gave birth to this child. Uh, you didn't give birth to that watch. So no, it's a true. Different, yes, so it's very different. So this mother should understand. She gave birth to this child. It's her responsibility. It's good for society, for her.